How many made it out to the afterglow last week? I mean, oh, yeah, quite a few of you. So awesome. Just to sit before the Lord, give him an opportunity to um, speak to us, minister to our hearts, get to, uh, you know, just really do some business with, with God in that sense and just allow him to do the deep, deep work that only he can do by the moving of his spirit and just so much deliverance. I really felt that uh, you walked out of here with a spring in your step, ready to conquer the world, and now you're back here again to get an exhortation, and that will also help us to conquer the world. This is a strong message tonight, talking about Lot's wife. All that we know about Lot's wife is written in her 15-word biography, and oh, What a biography this is. Verse 26 of chapter 19 says, But his wife, Lot's wife, looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Fifteen-word biography. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And even we know that When there is strong exhortation, it is for our good. For you say that we ought to exhort one another daily, lest our hearts become hard. And Lord, it is easy in the world today with so much hurt and uh, misgivings and wrongdoings that our hearts can become hardened. And so by your spirit tonight, would you just... Open up your word to us. Soften our hearts. Lord, may we receive the word that you have for us that would um, exhort us and comfort us and motivate us to do good works unto you. So, Lord, we just welcome any advice, any exhortation, because we know it is the softening of the heart when it comes forth. So make us attentive. And Father, we thank you so much for the work of the cross that it's because of Jesus that we're all here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. And all agreed said, Amen. Verse 26, But Lot's wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. We know nothing about this woman. We know nothing about her race or her family. We don't even know her name. We don't know how Lot and his wife met. We don't know when they got married, but we do know that they had two daughters. This is a woman that not too much, well, there's nothing good, in fact, said about her whatsoever. We're not looking at her life. We see nothing of her great influence, her great love, how she just endured great trials and tribulations, or her great kindness. We don't read about her great faith. All that we read about is her tragic death. That's her biography. Jesus had three words to say, reducing it down even more so. She's only mentioned twice in Scripture, and one is in this biography in Genesis 19. But Jesus had three words to say about Lot's wife. And in those three words, he is telling us how to live. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. In that, he says, study her. Understand where she went wrong. Know what to avoid. In, the, in that statement, in that statement, Jesus is bringing about, about a stern warning, a, a hard exhortation, a very strong exhortation, a stern warning, and an everlasting memorial. This pillar of salt will remain forever and ever as an everlasting memorial. There's only two memorials mentioned of women in the Bible. And Jesus is saying, here is another memorial. One was Mary who anointed his feet with oil. And Jesus said that wherever this gospel is preached, this will be a memorial unto her. And here is of what to do right. And now he is, repre- he is explaining here uh, when he says, remember Lot's wife, a memorial of what not to do, what to avoid. Jesus is talking to his disciples regarding the last days, what to expect about him coming back and what it will be like, what the days will be like when he comes back. And in that portion of scripture, he says that you're going to yearn for me to come back. The world is going to become so wicked. Things are going to become so hard. You're going to yearn for me to come back, but it won't be yet. And you are to stand 
on your convictions. You're to be led of me. And the lesson in that, he said, not only would it be as in the days of Noah, but it would also be as in the days of Lot. And in the days of Lot, they were building and planning, business as usual, not really believing that God would bring judgment or that the Lord was coming again. And in that, he says, remember Lot's wife as an exhortation. And Jesus, in this statement, just kind of cuts right through everything, all the rituals, all the religion and the practices and all. And he says, he says in this statement that, that he demands a heart change. So much so, a heart change within. That's what the Lord is. He says, I don't want rituals. I don't want services. I don't want religion. I want a heart change. I want your, cha- your heart to be changed. A dynamic relationship with us is so dynamic that it transforms our lives. That's what the Lord is talking about when he's ministering these words, remember Lot's wife. Not only that, but in this also he's bringing out the sense of readiness, to live in a state of readiness, to be ready for his return, that it, would, it could happen at any time, live as though it would happen in any time. And as we live in this state of readiness, understanding that it is God that changes my heart, that I am saved the blood of the Lamb, I'm forgiven, I'm in right standing with God, God changes my heart, I have a heart toward the Lord, I continue to uh, walk in his ways, and in that he keeps my heart tender and sensitive to the things that he would have me to do, a change of heart with my attitude and my way of thinking, but also to live in this state of readiness so that nothing whatsoever will take me by surprise, and nothing will interfere with me serving the Lord. And when you think of nothing taking us by surprise, no pain, no trial, no circumstance, no situation, no disappointment, nothing is going to take us by surprise because we know that God loves us and that nothing will touch our lives unless he allows it to do so. And so we live in this state of readiness, ready to go to heaven at any given time because we could be called home at any given time. Lot's wife lingered, she looked, and she longed. She lingered, she looked, and she longed for the things of Sodom. She lives in Sodom enjoying all the luxuries that a rich husband could possibly provide. She fell in love with her home. She made uh, worldly friends. She loved shopping. She loved the clothes. She loved the entertaining and got all wrapped up in these kinds of things, thinking that that's okay, that those things are all right in that sense of a priority. And when the destruction comes upon Sodom, she refuses to leave. She looks back, and she's turned into a pillar of salt. And Jesus' warning when he talks about remember Lot's wife, understand, study her, understand why this statement is made. The indictment that Jesus had on Lot's wife is that she regarded her stuff more important than the things of God. Her will, her pleasures, her comforts, her desires, her ambitions, her ideas were more important than anything else. It was all about her. Some say that Lot's wife was the mayor's wife. Some call her Lot's wife. Some call her the wife of Lot. But all agree she's the foolish woman. She had it all. She had everything going for her. But because of foolish decisions and bad choices, she loses it all. Everything. In a moment of decision, we see a dual tug-of-war going on within. The eternal um, pull of evil and the eternal pull of God. It's the flesh warring against the spirit, that war that goes on within us. Here is a major tug-of-war going on within her. The story of Sodom being destroyed and Lot's wife looking back as she's looking at the things that were once hers being destroyed, told not to look back and looks back anyway and is turned into a pillar of salt. The story takes place in between God's promise to Abraham that he would have a son, which would um, be Isaac, and the birth of Isaac. So the story is planted right in between when the angels came. If you remember now, that Abraham was visited by three angels. And these angels informed Abraham that Sarah would conceive and have a son. And that's when Sarah laughed. And um, then the statement came out that said, is anything too hard for God? I mean, you would laugh too if you were 90 years old and were going to 
you know, bear a child. And so the angel said that Sarah would conceive, and sure enough, nine months later, Sarah brings forth Isaac. These angels are called a theophanies. And one of these angels um, says that he, that he is the Lord. The Lord of, he said it's the angel of the Lord, or it's a theophanies of Jesus, that in fact Jesus came to visit Abraham that day. But not only did the angels tell Abraham that Sarah would conceive a son in her old age and bring forth Isaac, the promised child, but also the Lord said, I shall tell Abraham what I am about to do. And that would be that he was going to inform Abraham, who was called a friend of God. He's the father of our faith. And he was, God was going to tell Abraham that he was about to destroy Sodom. Sodom had become so wicked in its um, practices and how its lifestyle was, Sodom, Gomorrah, and a couple, two other cities in the region around the Dead Sea, that God could not save the people there. They were so wicked that the only, the only way to deal with it would be total destruction. So two angels head for Sodom to uh, let uh, Lot and his family know that destruction is coming, and the angel of the Lord, it says, stays with Abraham. And it's at this time when Abraham builds this altar of intercession. Never, ever underestimate the power of prayer. Abraham looked at Sodom, and he looked at that city to evangelize it. And the best way he began to evangelize that city, because he had a heart for the people, but especially for his nephew Lot, was to get down on his knees and begin to intercede. And who interceded with him as they knelt together was actually the Lord himself. And so Abraham and the Lord, and who teaches us to intercede? Who teaches us how to pray? But the Lord. Teach us to pray, Lord. Teach us how to pray, how to intercede. And in that prayer is when Abraham converses with the Lord and says, If there's 50 righteous, will you save the city? 50, 45, 40, 35, 30, you know, all the way down to 10. And the Lord agrees. If there are 10 righteous, I will spare the city. The only problem was it ends up that there was only one righteous. But even for one, God will deliver that one out of trouble. Lot's wife did not have to die. She was offered choices. She was offered the choice to obey and live or disobey and die. It's amazing to me as you look at this story of the angels, and look at verse 15 and read it through here. And it says, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, Lot, the men, these would be the angels, notice, laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city or took him outside of the city. Now, what amazes me here, they had a choice to be delivered or not to be delivered, to do what the Lord says or not to do what the Lord says, just like you and I. Every day, we have a choice to obey the word of God, to obey what he commands us to do or not. When we obey, we, we experience life and that more abundantly. But when we disobey, there are great consequences. And for Lot's wife, it brought about death. It can also bring about spiritual death in our lives when we disobey the Lord in that sense of knowing I'm disobeying him. What amazes me about this story is um, that God did everything possible to save Lot's wife. Gave her chance after chance. After, we're not talking about a second chance. We're talking about chance after chance after chance. Convincing her, working with her. And I just think of the scripture that says that, that God desires not one to perish, but that all would come to eternal life. God doesn't give up on anybody. We do sometimes, but the Lord does not. And I look at the, the extreme means in which God reaches out to Lot's wife to save her. He sends special messengers to talk with her, to convince her, to um, 
to rescue her from her own destructive choices. She chose to fall in love with Sodom. She chose to have worldly friends. She chose the environment in which she lived. That wasn't God's choices for her. That's something that she chose herself. And yet, even those destructive choices, God sends special messengers to rescue her. These angels that rescued her, notice what it says here, that they grabbed hold of her hand. They not only escorted her out of the city, but they took hold of her. They held on to her hand to pull her out of the city. I kind of got to thinking about this. And I thought to myself, you know, this brings great insight to that verse in in, uh, the New Testament where it says that we entertain angels unawares. I don't know that you're entertaining them so well. In the sense that we think maybe that one guardian angel can handle us, Mm. I think it takes many more angels to keep us out of trouble. You know, some of the things, the messes that we get ourselves into, one guardian angel is not going to do it. I know within my own life. We always talk about them beat, being beat up. There's no wings left on, there's no feathers on the wings. One guardian angel won't do it. We get ourselves in so many messes and so many troubles, so much trouble, that he will send to this extreme, he will send his angels to deliver you, to escort you, to literally pull you out physically. They were pulling her out of the city. Has God sent any angels your way? Do you feel the pull of God pulling you out of destroying yourself or pulling you out of a situation that you ought not to be in? Do you sense that pull? And I think of entertaining angels unaware unaware is not to offer them a cup of tea. It's to allow those ministering angels to do what they need to do in our lives. And it's amazing to me the extremes that God goes to to deliver us. Lot's wife was without excuse. First of all, she has a very rich heritage. Lot, as we know, was Abraham's nephew. Therefore, Lot's wife were influenced, had the godly influence of Abraham and Sarah pouring into their lives. They traveled as pilgrims onto the promised land. There was a lot of influence. There was a lot of teaching and training and talking about the Lord. No doubt she believed in the God of Abraham, and she probably worshipped at the altars that Abraham built. She was also well aware of the wickedness of Sodom. This was no secret. This was an opened, um, opened information. This was information everybody knew how wicked Sodom was. It was well known, and yet she chose to close her eyes to its wickedness and instead fell in love with what Sodom could offer. All the pleasures, all the comforts, all the wonderful things, the worldly things, everything that, that Sodom was a very rich, wealthy, beautiful place. It was lovely. And here we have a, a, a woman who, though she, she's living in pleasure, yet she's dead while she is living. Spiritually, there's just nothing there. No desire for the Lord as far as being right with the Lord. So she has a rich heritage. She knows about the Lord. Not only that, but she saw the supernatural and she witnesses the miraculous. Notice verse 1, the story begins, and it says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, in the evening time. She saw the angels, witnessed the supernatural, saw with her own eyes the two angels that came into her home. And not only that, witnessing the miraculous, remember now these angels had to blind the men of the city so that these men would not um, sexually harass Lot's daughters and these angels. So she saw the miraculous. She saw the supernatural. In verse 1 it says, And there came two angels to Sodom at, at evening time. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. This would be his social standing. Perhaps he was a judge, some kind of a political leader, uh, making the laws of the, of the land there or in the city. He no longer is living in a tent outside of Sodom. He now has established himself in the heart of this wickedness, in this wicked society. And I don't know if you know this or not, but Lot and his wife lived here for 20 years. That's a long time to deal 
with living in this situation and turning your eyes to it. It wasn't like they just moved there. They had been there a long, long time. And in this time, there is no testimony. There is no godly influence. The reason why? Because of tolerance. They tolerated the sin around them and said nothing about it. And Lot, seeing them, this is the angels, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold, now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your way. Just, just, just stay the night and keep on going. And they said, Nay, no, but we will abide in the street all night. Now, Lot is panicked. Because he knows what will happen to these two men if they camp out in the streets of Sodom. Verse 4 says, But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, come past the house round about. So before they could go to bed that night, notice both old and young, the men of the city, all the people from every quarter. And they came unto Lot and said unto them, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And that word know means have sexual intercourse with them. Now this, this society, um, what was wrong with them was that they, just, they, had, uh, they practiced violent sexual perversions of every kind that you can imagine. It was a common practice for the Canaanite culture, the pagan culture. Um, it was part of their religion. Homosexuality, incest, and bestiology were practiced openly and without shame. In this statement where both young and old, young men as well as the old men, coming out to want these two men that came into Lot's home, basically what it was saying was that the city was so bad that the male population, both young and old, came to rape the angels. That's a, that's a pretty bad situation. Not only did she see the supernatural and witnessed um, the miraculous because the angels had to end up blinding, bringing about a divine blindness to these men for safety, she watches her husband try to bargain with this unruly, violent crowd. And verse 8 says, Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. That not known man means that they were virgins. They had not had any relationships with men. Now, a couple things are maybe unclear to this because later on in the story, um, he's supposed to go get his son-in-law. So here it says that they were virgins. Now, possibly they were espoused to be married, and they were in that waiting time, that kind of time of engagement. Uh, Another um, possibility is that Lot did have two other daughters that were married. We don't know really, but these two daughters were virgins. We know that. Let me, I pray you, bring them out to you. And notice what he says. Do you to them as is good in your eyes, only to these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Now, do you find that to be a startling alternative offered by a believer? To give his virgin daughters to this crowd of men that were just burning in all kinds of sexual perversion and lust. What an alternative. And I think to myself, with tolerance and with compromise and with being dull of hearing to the the things of God, it's how low will we go? How, How far will we compromise? How much sin will we tolerate before something within us would stand up and say, no, this isn't right? And what also amazes me is that there is no objection from Lot's wife when her husband offers her virgin daughters to this crowd of men. She's a terrible mother, a horrible mother. In fact, we know later on in this story that these daughters thought nothing of having incest with their father. What kind of a mother was she? Terrible mother. What about us as far as sexual purity is concerned? Our culture just says that it's okay. There's nothing really wrong with it. And sometimes it's easier just not to say anything than it is to say something because of the repercussions. But to be an advocate of sexual purity 
Mothers teaching your children about the importance of sexual purity. Singles living in sexual purity. Having, just being an advocate, a promoter of sexual purity. On the way over, I was listening to um, the radio, Christian radio station, and Rebecca St. James was being interviewed. And the whole interview was her stand on abstinence. That she has such a message, and her, she, you could just hear her passion. And she says, I just, I just have a passion to get the message out that women, men, women, everyone should be just sexually pure. It's just her platform. It's what God has opened up for her through the books that she has written now and songs that she sings. And everywhere she goes, she sings the song, Wait for Me. She is such an advocate for sexual purity. Is that, is that just something that stirs within you? Are you an advocate for, spe- for sexual purity? We must be. She hears the angel's warnings. Notice verse 12. It says, And the men, these angels, said to Lot, Hast thou any besides? In other words, they're saying to them, Do you have any relatives in the city? Do you have any sons-in-laws, any daughters, any daughters-in-law, any friends or relatives? Because if you do, you need to go get them now. Right now, go get them and tell them that this city is about to be destroyed. That the sin of this city has raised up to God and he cannot tolerate it one more minute and he's bringing destruction. It is on its way and you need to get out of the city and we've come to rescue you. Do you have any friends, any relatives, anybody? And so the reason for this, in fact, it says in verse 13, because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. This was the reason for the destruction. Well, actually, it was the perverse sexual cries that had reached the ears of God. I mean, it just, this city was terrible. The whole region was so infected with sin. And so Lot goes out, it says in verse 14, and Lot went out to plead with them. But their response to him was, first of all, they thought that was ridiculous what he was saying. They thought he was joking, and worse yet, that he was out of his mind. There's something terribly wrong with you. In fact, um, you know, they, they start just kind of mocking him. His witness, his influence, he had none. He had lost his power to influence for good, for godliness. They didn't believe that he was serious. His family didn't even take him seriously. And then in verse 22, she hears the warnings of the angels, and it says, Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till or until thou become thither. In other words, it speaks of God's mercy. The angels are saying, We can't do anything until we get you out of this city. God's mercy his um, ability to deliver the righteous out of um, destruction. It also tells us about the power of prayer. That remember, Abraham and the Lord Jesus are kneeling down, interceding for this city, and especially for Lot. You have somebody that you love very much that is so ingrained in horrible sin. Where are we supposed to be? On our knees, interceding. The Lord Jesus joins us in that. This is the power of prayer. Never underestimate that. It also shows us that some are saved by the skin of their teeth. I mean, their their garments were smelling of fire running out of that city. And sometimes that's the way that some are going to get saved, by the skin of their teeth. But praise God, at least they get saved. It also speaks of Lot having a saved soul, but a wasted life. No influence, no testimony. He's, he's going to lose a lot, too. And then she's an eyewitness of the destructive power of God. We never must underestimate that when it is time, when there's no more repentance, that destruction will come. Payday will come. And we will pay for the sins of, of our, uh, the consequences of sin if, if they're not covered in the blood of the Lamb. The fire and the brimstone began to fall out of heaven. Verse 24, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. This was a command of God. This is what we would call an act of God. Earthquakes, there was a lot of earthquake uh, faults in the, in the area. There was a volcano. Some think it was made be a meteorite shower. There's a lot of oil fields and uh, combustible materials, and everything just started to explode. It was like raining fire from heaven. The entire area is burned up, 
and uh, set on fire and literally destroyed. Verse 25 says, And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the city and that which grew upon the ground. Everything, nothing survived. No vegetation, no people, no house, nothing survived. And nothing can grow there. To this day, it is, it's dead. The whole region is dead. Nothing can grow there. And it reminds us that our God is a consuming fire. It speaks of God using fire as judgment, but also it's used as a refining work of God, refiner's fire, to purify us. So for the child of God, refiner's fire is a good thing. That, that's a thing that we welcome, that we're not taken by surprise that God would sing, send refiner's fire that he would send upon our lives things that would refine us and purify us and burn away the, the dross or the things or the things that are not pleasing to the Lord, he, that our God is a consuming fire. We don't want the judgment of God. The blood of Jesus protects us from the judgment of God. But we are not to escape refiner's fire. That's what we experience. But it isn't something to dread. In fact, uh, Peter calls it fiery trials. Have you witnessed any of those lately? Has the fire come down? Has the temperature been heated up in your life? And instead of moaning and groaning about it, you can say, praise the Lord, God is working within my life. Because obviously there's some areas within my life that need to be burned, burned away, taken away. She represents a woman who willfully disobeyed. This is called willful disobedience, and I want to talk to you about this for just a moment. She was given specific instructions to obey. Nothing was, nothing was um, kept from her. She wasn't kept in the dark. This destruction did not come by surprise. And so this is called willful disobedience. This is for us who know to do good and choose not to do it. For that, for those of us that do good and don't do it, it is sin. And so this is sinning against knowledge. There's two types of sinning. You have sinning in ignorance, where honestly you didn't know that it was wrong. And you experience an awful lot of God's grace and, and his mercy and his compassion when we realize that we have done something wrong through ignorance. We didn't know it was wrong until God pointed it out that it was wrong through the word or through a Bible study or, or so, which it, God just shows you that thing is wrong in your life. That what you're doing is wrong according to the word of God. But before we didn't know that was wrong. We, we ha, we've been a byproduct of this society. And in that there's a lot of mercy and a lot of grace. But this is a, a different kind of sinning that Lot's wife got caught in. You see, Lot's wife knew better. She had been instructed. She had been taught. She had the influence of Abraham and Sarah. She also was married to a godly man. Now, there's a lot of questions and controversy about that, but we're not talking about the man. We're talking about the woman. I got a big debate about this man, but that is not really what we're going to talk about. We don't talk about the husband and his uh, you know, faults or his strengths. Or We're talking about the woman because every one of us are responsible for our own spiritual life. She had all the information that her husband had. She was given everything possible to show her the way. An angel physically pulling her out of destruction, and yet she still chooses to turn back. She is sinning against knowledge. There is a far greater consequence. God will deal far more severely with us when we choose to sin against knowledge. We know it's wrong, and yet we, are, we don't care at that point. We're just going to get mad. We're going to say the word. We're going to stomp, and we're going we're to make a scene, and we're going to add fuel to the fight. We know that's wrong, but we're going to do it anyway, because for some reason, the old woman gets some satisfaction out of that. That's sinning against knowledge. You know that's wrong, and yet you continue on that road. It's like this, this sense of rebellion wells up within us. Now, I know that none of you do this, have you had this kind of a week? I mean, you know, where you just, you have the opportunity to do good, but you choose to do, not to do good. You just don't want to. I've had it. I've been good long enough. Doesn't, 
I'm going to be bad today. You just choose to be that way, sinning against knowledge. She has given specific instructions to obey, verse 17 says, and it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, notice, escape for your life. We're talking about our spiritual well-being here, the words of God. This is a strong exhortation. Are you concerned about your spiritual life? Escape for your life. If you stay in this place any longer, it's going to consume you. It's going to destroy you. And God is always concerned with our spiritual well-being, and so should we be. Escape for your life. Look not behind thee. In other words, the angel is giving specific instructions. Do not look back, neither stay Thou in all the plain. Don't stay where you are. You can't just stop. You've got to keep going in the direction that God is taking you. With no regrets about looking back. It doesn't matter what you're going to lose. It's what you're going to gain. She was so caught up in what she was going to lose, she failed to see all that she would gain. But we get caught up in this as well. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. That was the warning. That was the instruction. What about us today? What is the Lord saying, don't do that? Or what is, it, is he saying, um, don't do what? What is he speaking to your heart about today? An area in your life that you are to lay it aside, get rid of it. Don't do that. No more bitterness. No more unforgiveness. Let's deal with this. Let's get deliverance from this. It's here. It's, God has it for us. We choose not to walk in deliverance but rather to just be, you know, beat up by the enemy. And in that, our spiritual life is stunted. What is the Lord speaking to your heart today about? Don't do that. Don't do what? What is it that you're not to be doing? It is a, a, a specific word. And for some of us in this room, we are playing with the fires of the world. And there needs to be more of a separation. Be ye separate. Uh, Separate yourself from the world. We are not like them. We don't think like them, but we love them. You hate the sin and love the sinner. But unless you are sure of the path on which you are on, and unless God is working greatly within your life, you're not going to be strong enough to pull others out of the fire. And there's so many that the enemy is taking and burning, and we need to be the ones that will be the ones that God will send to rescue Notice that she heard but only partly believed. It said, verse 26, but his wife looked back from behind him and became a pillar of salt. She stands as an everlasting monument against immorality, against unbelief, disobedience, rebellion, materialism, coveting, um, greed, selfishness. She is a permanent, everlasting Monument, this pillar of salt. In fact, it's supposed to be there still today. If you would visit Israel, you'll see this, this, this form of this, these salt things that looks like a woman. And everybody says, that's Lot's wife, that pillar of salt. It's an everlasting monument. God has her there after all these years as a reminder. Remember Lot's wife. Don't become like her. Don't get caught up in materialism. Don't get caught up in me, you know, I have to have this and I have to have that and it's just, that's what's going to make me happy about me, myself, and I. She heard but only partly believe, believed because obedience demands a degree of sacrifice and that's where we struggle. i got to give up something. Are we really giving up something? Or are we allowing God to set us free? Is that truly a lie from the enemy? What are we giving up? Misery? Unforgiveness, bitterness, a lack of love, a lack of direction, a lack of victory, defeat. Are those things, that those are the things that we're giving up. But the enemy comes in and says, oh, you're making this great sacrifice if you obey God. No, I'm going to be set free. I'm going to live if I obey God. She was unwilling to give up her old ways and follow God. Unwilling to live in newness of life, led by the Spirit, motivated by the Spirit, energized by the Spirit. We make choices every day. That's, there's nothing unusual about that. We make choices of what to eat, what to wear, uh, you know, what to give away, what to keep, what friends to have, the selection of friends, what courses to take, how we're going to spend our time. We're making choices all the time. But when it is for selfish motives, 
This is what's going to happen. I will neglect to think about my spiritual well-being. And that will be laid aside. So when you make decisions, and when you are at a crossroads in your life, and there is a moral dilemma that you are facing, think about the decision that you make, the way that you go, um, what you do. Will it cause you to grow as far as your spiritual life is concerned? Will that move? Will that decision? Will that thing bring about spiritual growth within our lives? Now, there's three things I want you to ask yourself when, you have, when you're faced with making a decision. I want you to write these down. You're standing at a crossroads, and, or you're, you've got a moral dilemma. Because there's a lot of things in the Word of God that are very specific, but there's a lot of things that become personal convictions. And for us, we're all at different levels in our spiritual walk. But the main thing is that nothing should get in the way of growing spiritually. So if there's something that's preventing you from growing spiritually, put that aside and put yourself under that place where you're going to grow spiritually, and God will honor that, and you will, you will walk in victory. You'll understand what, it's, um, what it is to uh, be strong in the Lord. Number one, will it stumble or lead another into sin? That's the first question that you have to ask. Will what I'm going to do, the decision that I'm going to make, the way I'm going to take, Will it stumble or lead another into sin? Question number two. Will it cause me to neglect my spiritual life or me growing in my faith or growing in the Lord? Will this decision, this this way that I choose, will it cause me to neglect my spiritual life and not to grow? Number three, will it bring glory to God? Is it honorable? Does it line up with God's word? Is this what God has spoken for me to do? Is it the command that he has asked me to obey? And once we make that decision and we govern our lives by three little simple questions when we ask ourselves, God will speak and God will direct. Because I can be confident that God will direct my every step. However, my part, I must seek his will through prayer, through Bible study, and most importantly, listening to my divine counselor, the Holy Spirit. He is working, just like the angels were working desperately to save Lot's wife. I don't know how more, how much more God can do, but if we understand the reality of this spiritual walk, this walk with the Lord, that is how real the Lord wants to become. We feel his tug. We know the the nudging, the impression, and we just simply obey, knowing that as soon as we make that choice, then God will give us the strength and the power and the enabling and the ability to go through with it. It's a work of God. We just have to come to the place to say, I don't want to be Lot's wife. No way. And we receive this exhortation. Be careful with materialistic things. Be careful with um, uh, compromising in the moral realm, uh, the tolerance of sin around us, you know, that we make a stand, tough love, those kinds of things. And in your own decision-making, make sure that you ask yourself those questions. Will it stumble someone or lead another into sin? Will it cause me to neglect my spiritual life and I will stunt the growth my, my spiritual growth? Will it bring glory to God? Does it line up with God's word? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that, Lord, the reality is that not everybody follows you. If we would just study women that were just so right on with you, we really wouldn't have the whole counsel of God. And I thank you, Lord, for this lesson, although I know it's strong, and yet it's to prevent us from falling and to cause us to walk in victory. That's your, desire in, in, that's your desire for us. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for the tough lessons. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.